Good morning and welcome to our virtual service, a very special one in that it is our anniversary Sunday here at First Baptist Church Simcoe. So welcome. It's good to have you all tuning in. Today, as I mentioned, is already, uh, already is a very special day and I want to thank all those who are participating in putting elements of this service together so that we might in truly uh, celebrate God's faithfulness to this congregation over, not decades, but almost two centuries. It's a wonderful, wonderful legacy. First, I want to call us to worship with these words. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. To the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre, for you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At, your, at the works of your hands, I sing for joy. Let's pray together to begin this time. We praise you, God of all being. You give food to the hunger. You set prisoners free. You open the eyes of the blind and lift the spirit of those bowed down. Because you are righteous, you sent Christ to redeem the lost and the wayward. We come into your presence, enlivened by your Holy Spirit, and full of new hope to give you the honor due your glorious name. Amen. I worship you as long as I 
Hello again, and uh, it's wonderful to be able to be sharing with you on this uh, virtual service for May the 30th. This is also a very special Sunday for us at First Baptist Church. Um, this is our, of course, our anniversary Sunday, so even though we can't be together, we're going to mark this very special occasion. Now, this little segment, of course, is for the young and the young at heart, and I welcome you. So I want to speak to the children, particularly today, about something very special, and that is our church anniversary. It's hard to believe, maybe, how long First Baptist Church has been in Simcoe. It's over 180 years. Wow, 180 years. The sanctuary where we gather for worship when we're allowed, when we're not in a pandemic, is 100 years old, this, this part of the building. Now, this will really surprise you, I'm sure. It's not the original sanctuary. The original sanctuary actually burned to the ground and had to be rebuilt. And Mr. Hoover's grandfather, Jay Hoover's grandfather, was uh, the chief builder of that particular project a long time ago. That's a long time ago. 
Now, the Sunday school room or the parlor where we have our refreshment time after church, that's not original either. It was uh, changed out in the 1990s, and it's different too. So the building has changed. We got a new roof just two years ago, I should mention that. The building has changed. Hmm? The books that we use, the hymn books, the Bibles, etc., have changed. And the people have changed. It's hard to believe that 180 plus years ago, there were little children just like you coming to Sunday school and going to classes, etc., and enjoying learning about Jesus. And that's been going on for over 180 years. Wow. So there have been a lot of changes here at First Baptist Church over its history. Lots of them. And there's been a lot of really wonderful people who uh, put a lot of energy and a lot of love and a lot of care into making sure that this congregation, its mission to the community continued throughout almost two, dec two centuries. Hard to believe. Well, there have been a lot of changes, but you know what? There's been one thing that hasn't changed. It's been the same from day one that the church started until today in our congregation. And that is God. God has never changed. God's love for us, God's call to us to serve him, and God's particular care of all of you. Today's sermon is talking about young ones, children. And so we want to remember that you're very important to us at First Baptist Church. You are the future, but you're also the present too. And I encourage you to think of yourselves as a full part of our church family. So I hope, I don't know how you could do it, but maybe you can come up with a cool idea to celebrate our anniversary together. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the witness and the ministry of First Baptist Church Simcoe. For over 180 years, men, women, and children have all come to worship, to serve, and to have fellowship with one another. Thank you, Father, for all those who continue to look after not only this building, but more importantly, continue to look after us. God bless each one, we pray, and may you give us many, many years ahead to serve you in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, take care, and uh, again, God bless you all. We've been going through a lovely little series. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am and preparing it uh, regarding people we need in our lives. 
And today we're looking at uh, a very special young lady that maybe you've never heard about before or have really thought about before. So Acts chapter 12, verses 6 to 17. That very night before Herod was going to bring him out, Peter, bound with two chains, was sleeping between two soldiers while the guards in front of the door were keeping watch over the prison. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He tapped Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his wrists. The angel said to him, Fasten your belt and put on your sandals. He did so. Then he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter went out and followed him. He did not realize that what was happening with the angel's help was real. He thought he was seeing a vision. After they had passed the first and second guard, they came before the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went outside and walked along a lane when suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all the Jewish people that were, sorry, all that the Jewish people were expecting. As soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many had gathered and were praying. When he knocked on the outer gate, a maid named Rhoda came to answer. On recognizing Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the gate, she ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she insisted that it was so. They said, it is his angel. Meanwhile, Peter kept knocking. And when they opened the gate, they saw him and were amazed. He motioned to them with his hands to be silent. And he described for them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he added, tell this to James and to the believers. Then he left and went to another place. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today, we're looking at that we all need a rota in our lives. One Sunday um, in the primary Sunday school class of a particular church, the children had completed their lessons and had some time left, so they were busy playing with toys and coloring pictures. One young boy at the very end of the table was feverishly coloring away with a box of crayons. As a teacher watched the boy, he switched colors often and with great speed. He was not distracted at all by the other children who were noisily interacting all around him. Well, curiosity got the best of the teacher, and she crept up slowly to see what it was that he was drawing. Now, the picture was clearly that of a man's head, and the teacher assumed he was creating a picture of the biblical story they had that day, and it was about Moses. So the teacher asked him gently, may I ask what you're drawing? And the young boy, without even lifting his head, said, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher replied, but no one knows what God looks like. To which he replied, they will when I finish the picture. I'm sure that the teacher got a chuckle from that child's answer. Perhaps she would have responded as we might, thinking, that the naivety of that little boy is charming. Remember our link letter used to say, kids say the darndest things. As charming as we think events like the picture in the Sunday school room are, eventually we come to the point where we have to admit that he or she is just a child. Soon we think and even hope that they will grow up and they will think differently, they'll become more logical, they will become more practical. How many times did your mother or father, while you were growing up, said, when will you grow up? Today, we confront, you and I, our need to have a rota in our lives. 
Because frankly, this we are confusing childlikeness with childishness, and it's ruining us. But first, let's meet Rhoda from the book of Acts. Now, Rhoda was a servant girl in the Greek language, a pediski, which means little girl or maiden. Her name was shortened, and it, the shortened version of her name, Rhoda, actually means, translated, rosebud. Rhoda was a servant girl in the household of Mary, who was the mother of John Mark. Many scholars believe that this was the house where the Last Supper was actually held, and it is also the headquarters for the early Jerusalem church. Specifically, Rhoda's main job in the household was to be the doorkeeper. And if this was the site of the first church, she would have been very busy at her job as people came and went from the house. It would appear from the brief description we have that Mary's house was of typical Jerusalem design. There was the main house, of course, but the main house would have been fronted by a walled courtyard and it would have a gate or door in it for people to come in. Rhoda, being a member of the household, would have been fully instructed in the Christian faith. She would have been present attending services and prayer gatherings. It would appear that although a young girl, she had a pretty dynamic faith. Now, on the night in question, Peter had been imprisoned by Herod. James had already been executed by Herod, and the church feared that Peter would be next. Luke tells us that during the night, the Lord came, an angel of the Lord came and physically escorted Peter out of the jail and onto the street. Peter himself, as we read, wasn't even sure if the experience was real, but once he reached the street and the angel left him, he realized what God had done for him. Not knowing what else to do, Peter heads to the one place he knows for sanctuary. He goes to Mary's house. Now, meanwhile, the early church was doing what we might do when we are faced with a crisis in our fellowship, and this time it was Peter's imprisonment. We had gathered together at Mary's house, and we would be in prayer in earnest hope for Peter's safety. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door, and Rhoda dutifully gets up to see who it is. Now, being very safety conscious, Rhoda does not open the door immediately, but instead asks who it is, and Peter identifies himself to Rhoda. Now, what happens next is very childlike. So full of excitement, Rhoda runs back into the prayer meeting without even letting poor Peter in. Overcome with joy, she can hardly get the words out that Peter is at the door. The believers who had just been gathered to pray for a miracle, they mock Rhoda. The only explanation they can come up with to explain what Rhoda had heard at the door must be Peter's angel, or in other words, Peter has died. Finally, after much persistence by Rhoda, the doubtful church goes to the door and opens it, and behold, Peter is standing there. Now, Luke wants us to see something quite vital here. It was Rhoda, a small young girl, who believed. It was a child who pointed out to the gathered adults that their prayers had been answered. Now, here's something you've undoubtedly heard many times before, but maybe have never fully reflected on. Why does Jesus in the Gospels affirm at least a few times that children come first in the kingdom of God? Think about that. Why when Jesus wants to demonstrate what discipleship is like, he picks up a small child and plops him or her on his knee? Why a child? Why not select a biblical scholar or a devout monk, maybe not put them on his knee, but point them out. 
we might be inclined to say it is because children are innocent and trusting or maybe more truthful. Are you kidding? Study your history and examine your theology and even explore your own childhood and you soon see that childhood is anything but the sentimental whitewash we try to paint it with. Before the 1800s in the Victorian age, there was no protection at all for children, none. Did you realize that? In the United States, there was the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals before there was one for children. People were more concerned about the abuse of horses than they were about children. Even today, in some countries, children are exploited. Girls are married off at the age of nine. Children work in unsafe sweatshops or chemically laden mining operations or are forcibly trained to be child soldiers or used as prostitutes. I've heard about a very ugly trend in some parts of our world. It's horrible. It's called sex tourism. And so it is to Haiti, the Dominican Republic and Thailand and some other places where men, many many even from Canada, go and go to or travel to to sexually abuse and exploit children. Now, arrests are quite rare in these countries because the pimps, the ones who own these children, pay off the police to look away. Up until the Victorian age, did you know it was still legal to publicly execute a child? Now, in Jesus' day, children were of no account at all. They enjoyed a lower status than women, and that wasn't a very high status to begin with. Some rabbis said it would be better to burn a Torah, that is the Old Testament, than give it to a woman. The little ones were insignificant, they were degraded, they were neglected, they were despised, and it was much worse for girls than it was for boys. Still is in many countries today. Maybe you'll remember a few years back, there was a CBM program, which I thought was marvelous, called She Matters, trying to help young girls and young women. Jesus' whole message and approach to the good news was that the last shall be first, the meek shall inherit the earth, and the little ones will be great in the kingdom of God. How short-sighted we are. We dare not leave children behind. And notice I said children and not childish ways. Childish and childlike are vastly different things. And far too often we confuse the two that leads to our detriment. Leonard Sweet we tells an incident that I personally as a pastor have also encountered over the years. He points out that the J.K. Rawlings Harry Potter books had come out and many Christian parents took to banning the stories in their homes. I know of one person in particular who banned these books in her home but thought nothing of her sons playing violent video games like Call of Duty. When Sweet was at a conference of Christian school principals he referenced one of his talk it referenced in one of his talks the book series and in a break after the session a group of very angry educators cornered him and said dr sweet don't you know that such stories lead children astray and they glorify evil but these are just stories he said they are the modern day versions of the brothers grimm or aesop's Fables or Mother Goose or Hans Christian Andersen or Lewis Carroll. They replied, there is no such thing as just stories. And Sweet points out that, yeah, they're, they're right about that. Harry Potter's stories are not innocent but insidious stories, they said. They're full of magic and witchcraft and spells and all sorts of evil. And Sweet replied, 
and the Brothers Grimm aren't? And besides, our children know that these stories are made up and not true real-life stories. But they can't tell the difference, the educator said. And Sweet says, he didn't say it out loud, but he thought to himself, wait a minute, who is it who can't tell the difference? Three times Jesus ties spiritual maturity to our relationships with children. In Matthew 19, he says, Let the little children come to me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. This particular passage comes immediately after Jesus defends himself on being single and childless. Now, I've never really reflected on it or even talked about it very much, but it would have been quite odd to the people who met Jesus that he was not married and had no children of his own. In Jewish culture, that was very rare. Men without a family were suspect in that culture. A father was expected when a boy hit about 12 years of age or his bar mitzvah year, and before he was age 22, to have made a marriage arrangement for his son. So for an older, single, childless man to use children as a symbol for entering the kingdom of God had a double oddness to it for his listeners. The second time, and maybe the most famous one, occurs at a time when the disciples were fighting with one another over who was the greatest. A disgusted Jesus picks up a child and places the child on his knee and said, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. If you are too old to hold a child in your arms or in your heart, you are already spiritually dead. Be careful how you treat the little ones. The special status of children is reinforced in our third example in the harshest warning that Jesus ever uttered. If you harm a child or make a child stumble, he said, it would be better if a great millstone was strung around your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. I think you get the point. We need rotas in our lives to get us to encounter the joy and the life-affirming nature of play. To see the joy in the simple things of life. To value and encourage imagination. To help us daydream. God works in our occupations as much as our recreation and in our playtime. It is even to our detriment that we ever believe that a vacation, a day off, or a special event spent in a fictional book, or playing games with family and friends is ever a waste of time. Sometimes it may be the most important thing we can do at a given moment. Now, this next thing that Rhoda's do for us may be controversial, but I think Leonard Sweet is on to something vital here. Rotas keep us scared. Hmm. Every time we go through the Halloween season and we, want, we wonder sometimes why we have this focus on ghosts and witches, etc. Why did the Brothers Grimm have such frightening elements in their stories? Now, I should point out actually that the, er, the versions of, of the Grimm stories that we have now are actually quite tame compared to the originals. For example, in the original Cinderella, the ugly stepsister actually cuts off the end of her foot to try and get into the glass slipper. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> These stories, both ancient and modern, they cause us to get goosebumps. But they have a very positive purpose. They help children master their fears. Over time, children begin to realize that there are no monsters under the bed, but they will realize that there are monsters in every city and every town. You cannot encourage someone to be a hero if there isn't a villain. There's no Superman without a Lex Luthor. There's no Batman without a Joker. There is no joy or happiness without the contrast of darkness. 
Rotas also keep us small. You watch a child as he or she takes considerable time to examine closely something very small. Jesus was always using simple things to teach significant lessons. He took mustard seeds and compared them to the power of faith. He, he took bread and wine and infused it with a very powerful meaning. In becoming human, Jesus literally became small. We are so blind to the marvel and beauty of this world, but a child is not. Rhodas also live large by investing in the littleness of life. You know, it's fun to watch a child who takes an empty box, and suddenly they are using that box like it's a rocket ship, and they're blasting off into the cosmos. Only a child could ever think they could capture the essence of God with a box of crayons and a piece of paper. And who knows, maybe he did catch a piece of what God is like in that picture. If you're not sure of the power of small things in your life, have you ever encountered a mosquito? Oof. Rhodas also find it quite easy to ask and to seek and to knock as Jesus called us to do. Sometimes a child can ask the most profound questions with such few words. Children ask questions like, who am I? Why am I here? What am I? Remember your three-year-old learning the wonder and the power of the question, why? Why, Daddy, is something I heard many times. And I must admit my inadequacy by replying, well, just because. <laughs> Often Rhodas ask the same questions that we personally want to ask, but we're afraid to, lest we seem less pious or less faithful. Rhodas also keep us light. You know, gravity is an essential thing, but it's a curse to us adults. Over time, gravity takes its toll on our bodies. We sag, we wear out. But did you also know that your soul can succumb to gravity too? General Douglas MacArthur said, you don't get old from living a particular number of years. You get old because you've deserted your ideals. Years wrinkle your skin. Renouncing your ideals wrinkles your soul. Worry, doubt, Fear and despair are all enemies which slowly over time bring us or grind us down and make our souls weary and weak. Rhodas call us back to enjoy novelty and adventure and surprise. Without a Rhoda, you might say, I'm having a senior's moment. Please excuse me. With a Rhoda in your life, you might say, I'm having a God moment. Please join with me. Did you know that the word animation, which we use often to describe cartoon-like shows and movies, comes from the word anima, which means alive. In the world of a child, everything's alive. Jerry Griswold observes how in children's stories, all God's creatures seem to be quite chatty whether they be bears or birds or cats, elephants, bugs, lions, dogs, monkeys, fish in the sea, they're all talking. The world of magic is the world of a child. Children live in a different time zone than we do. You and I, we, we tend to think about the past and the future, but you know what? Children live in the now. Nothing upsets a child more than being told, not now. To a Rhoda, life is too valuable, too dynamic, and too incredible to wait until later to enjoy it. Maybe our manifesto should be, this is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Too many of us have believed that to mature, we've had to basically become comatose. <laughs> but this... By this, I mean that we just go through life on kind of autopilot. Without rotas in our lives, our minds turn to mush or machines. 
we become people, sadly, who are just walking around waiting to die. I want to close today by giving us all a prescription to help us reconnect with our rotas. Why not this week take time to play with a child or read a child's book, children's book to a child? Why not take the time to watch an animated movie with or animated movie about talking animals and better yet watch it with a child? When was the last time you read a good fiction novel or watched a television or a movie series? When was the last time you laughed so hard your belly ached and tears came to your eyes? When was the last time you were silly and didn't care who saw or who saw you or what they thought? When was the last time you bought a toy for someone instead of writing a check? We need a rota in our lives. We need a rosebud to blossom into the joy and the abundance of life the way God intended it. Please join me in a time of prayer. Great are your words, O God, and you make our hearts glad. Wherever we look, we see your goodness. Throughout history, we have, we have, you have restored the fortunes of your chosen people. And barren lands, you led them to living waters. When they were hungry, you sent manna to sustain them. Those who went forth Weeping, return home with shouts of joy, recounting the benefits of your wondrous love. We give thanks for Christ, in whose name we inherit your mercy, and confess anew our faith in him as our high priest. He bore our weaknesses in his body and thereby made us strong. We give thanks that he lives among us today to encourage the faint-hearted, empower the weak and comfort the lonely, and bring release to the captives. Through him we are able to serve beyond and above and beyond our collective abilities, and for that legacy we give you thanks. We give thanks today for your Holy Spirit, who renews our flagging spirits and sends us forth with praise on our lips. In the midst of doubt, your spirit brings clarity, When we are weary, your spirit revives us. We can rely on your spirit during lonely adventures and throughout our wanderings, we are never without your presence. Our hearts are filled with joy, thanks to your graciousness, O God. Our eyes see more clearly thanks to the vision of Christ our Savior. Our whole cells move freely thanks to your indwelling spirit. Oh, how great are your works. And today, oh God, we are particularly thankful, particularly grateful for the enduring uh, presence your spirit has had in this community through this fellowship. We thank you that First Baptist Church Simcoe has stood in this place with these people for almost 200 years. We thank you for the men and the women who went before us, who faithfully served you in all aspects of service and mission to this community. We thank you for the legacy they left us. And we thank you for the men and the women and the children who today are making a difference in this world because of the encounters they have had with Jesus in this place. Father, bless this fellowship. Help us to be able to return soon into uh, personal and, um, pres- and present company so that we can join together in this place to worship you. Father, please keep those who are ill safe. Keep those like young Royer, who we got to know, healthy and uh, heal him so he can return to school. And now, Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us, both in the past and in the future. 
but especially right now in the present. We offer our prayer, Father, in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing at home or hear with our hearts a new song introduced to us on Good Friday, Living Hope.
thank you again for tuning in and being a part of this virtual time of worship. I would like to dismiss us now with a word of benediction. Let us go and make our contribution to God, to this world, and to all who live therein. Let us not scramble to sit in the most honorable places or rush to recite the longest prayers, but let us, in our giving, offer up all the living we have to the glory of God and to the love of mankind. Amen. Thank you.